Good morning. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see such a full auditorium, and I understand we have quite an audience on our webcast as well. I'm Marcia McNutt. I'm president of the National Academy of Sciences. So for those of you who attended two previous colloquia that we had on the science of science communication, you'll remember that my predecessor, Dr. Ralph Cicerone, was a prominent organizer and participant. And I'm sorry to say that tragically Ralph died in November of 2016, not long after I succeeded him here at the Academy, and that cut too short a distinguished career in science. In 2010, Ralph and his colleagues here at the Academy were growing increasingly frustrated that the public didn't accept the scientific evidence about the human causes of climate change, the benefits of stealth stem research, the safety of genetically modified foods, and other matters. He thought that the stakes were too high uh, to perpetuate ignorance of what science knows to be true. And Ralph looked around for experts who could help solve the puzzle of why people ignored the facts of science around these polarizing topics. To begin with, he invited social science specializing in science communication research to address the governing council of the academy um, to talk to us about how uh, we could better understand this dilemma. Those science communication scientists heard the frustration of the council members who lamented that, first of all, no one seemed to be listening to the scientific facts, or if they listened, they don't accepted what science tells them, and they felt that no one trusted science and scientists. But paradoxically, the communication scholars pointed them to polling results that actually showed that there was high trust and confidence in science generally, and people actually felt that science was of great benefit to citizens of the world. So that led to uh, the consideration in light of the positive results for council to ask, then why don't more people accept evolution and understand that climate change is real and that it's anthropogenic. In short, they wanted to know why people don't accept the scientific consensus on so many topics, given their high confidence in science generally. Ralph facilitated many interactions among Academy members and social, behavioral, and decision scientists to better understand the cognitive underpinnings of people's perceptions of specific science issues and the political and social environment that shapes the messages they receive. After hearing from these science communication researchers, Ralph and some prominent members of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine initiated a series of colloquia on the science of science communication, the first of which took place in 2012. These colloquia were intended to share research in science communication, to build the capacity for the study of science communication, and to improve its practical application. One of Ralph's legacies is the insistence that how we communicate about science be based on evidence generated by the social sciences. And now I have the great honor of building on this fine foundation. We have come so far since 2012 in our understanding of the processes that lead to rejection of scientific facts and in applying that understanding to our own practice. But we still have a long way to go. Let's all learn as much as we can from each other over the next two days. We must make sure that we apply the science evidence gleaned in these sessions to dramatically improve how we communicate about science with public audiences. The health and well-being of the world's citizens depend upon it. Now before we get started, I have a number of people I want to thank for their hard work. Uh, Karen Cush, uh, Baruch Fischoff, Alan Leshner, and Dietram Schuffel. I also deeply appreciate the contributions of our generous sponsors who have made the two days possible. Uh, for example, uh, we have um, support from the Alfred, the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, 
the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Gordon and Betty Moore Fund, the Kavli Foundation, the Penn State Science Communication Program, the Rita Allen Foundation, um, Science Sandbox, which is a Simons Foundation initiative, and the William and F Hew Flora Hewlett Foundation. And of course, thanks go out to all of you for your dedication and interest in improving Science Foundation. But this um, forum would, this colloquium would not be happening without the support of Jillian Sackler. Dame Jillian Sackler and her foundation are, for whom this colloquium is named, are the guiding force for it. And I'd like to invite to the podium next Dame Jillian Sackler to say a few words. Thank you, Marsha. Um, well, good morning. Thank you all very much for coming. I almost feel a bit apologetic because there has been so much bad publicity about the Sackler family this year. And Marsha thought that I might clarify the situation a bit. Um, I think that it really has arisen due to the opioid crisis. And um, I just want to say that um, Arthur was not involved at all. I don't think he ever heard of Purdue Pharma or OxyContin, which was introduced almost a decade after he had died. Um, and none of the revenue that he got or I got or his foundations get are anything to do with um, OxyContin or opioids or any pharmaceutical company actually. Um, and just to say a word about Arthur, there aren't very many people who remember him now because he died 30 years ago this year. But he was a great humanitarian. He was um, working virtually his whole life to um, bring better health around the world. He was also working on peace with China and Israel and the Vatican and um, trying to make the world a better place. Um, he first of all um, helped his family. Um, they lost their money in the depression when he was 13 and he supported his parents from about that age. Uh, he went out working to deliver flowers and newspapers and things like that. He became business manager at his, for his school yearbook and made small commissions and things. He put himself, his two younger brothers, through school, medical school, started or bought all the family businesses. So the, f the brothers and the family <laughs> are not all interchangeable. He also was the great art connoisseur and collector. He, um, he felt the need to live with original art uh, when he was very young and uh, as an impoverished medical student he bought his first, um, first work at auction uh, which was an American painting so he first collected American paintings and then he um, went on to make um, very large collections especially of antiquities um, and he said that uh, he collected as a scientist because he wanted to um, study um, how, how these peoples lived. Um, and then, of course, he was a scientist. He formed his own laboratory. He told me that he thought that he squandered his birthright by not concentrating on science. He wanted to be a medical researcher, but after he graduated, his uh, he, there was a family conference with his father and uncles and they begged him to go into commerce and 
help the family, but he did start his own laboratory, and uh, he was he did all the experiments, he wrote all the papers, and he was um, nominated for uh, the Nobel Prize for his research into schizophrenia. Um, he identified um, uh, various hormones like histamine and the thymus and other things, and um, so um, he he. Uh, um, that was a very important part of his life. Uh, he also was um, a, a communicator. Uh, he started the first medical newspaper for doctors uh, to bring news of uh, new developments around the world. And it was in, um, uh, I think he had offices in about 11 countries and went to 20 countries. And um, Michael DeBakey told me after Arthur died, it was so innovative that nobody thought it would work at the time. And uh, then, of course, you know, there were many other papers that started. They were all very, very successful. So um, it's kind of ironic that um, he was such a great communicator. And now, 30 years after his death, there are a lot of communications which are false. And uh, you would think really now with the internet um, that um, it would be easier to get the word out, but actually it's more complicated because people can write anything at all and maybe they have an agenda or you don't, I mean there's, a, I'm trying to correct the record, I'm writing to publications and things like that, and they never print anything. And uh, it seems to me that um, you, need, um, you need to employ a PR or something to, to really deal with it, or maybe you never can deal with it. Um, so it's a very difficult situation, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I'm I'm really dealing with a lot of fake news, and I'm trying to correct it, and I hope I can. So uh, just to um, be clear that um, uh, he was a very fine person. He never made money in any horrible way at all. And so this uh, colloquium is not supported um, from any uh, such uh, opioids or anything like that. I wanted to say that. Um, and of course we are talking now uh, today and tomorrow about communication, science communications. And uh, we all know that there are a lot of problems. So I hope that um, we, we can maybe make some recommendations which will make, make a, a difference. But uh, anyway, just in short, um, I am extremely proud of my name, and I'm extremely proud of Arthur. So thank you very much. <laughs>